All right, well, Proverbs can be divided into three sections, right? The book of Proverbs, the first nine chapters, which we've covered, was wisdom for young people. And now we're in the second section, um, in uh, chapters 10, all the way through, I believe it's 27 or something, is wisdom for all people. And then chapters 27 to the end of the book is wisdom for leaders. Um, sorry if you're taking notes and I didn't have just the right outline there. Um, chapters 1 through 9, wisdom for young people. Chapters 10, I didn't write it on there either. <laughs> Ten and on. Ten through twenty-four. There it is. I wrote it down somewhere. It was just a matter of finding. So chapters ten through twenty-four is wisdom for all people, and then twenty-five through thirty-one will have wisdom for leaders. So we're in the midst of wisdom for all people. So be of good cheer. If you're here, this is for you. And we saw that even when, when it was with young people, we saw how um, we can all take from the wisdom that's there. But um, Proverbs are really short, and especially this section that we got into from chapters 10 through 24, Wisdom for All People, we see the difference kind of it's no longer really instruction just to his son or just to his children, but these are short, kind of one sentence, one phrase even, um, powerful punches, we might say. Just really hits you hard. Um, and there's enough to kind of make, it, and it is kind of one of the hardest books, I think, for any preacher to teach on, because you can add a lot, there's a whole sermon in just one verse. And so we just, these first couple of verses in chapter 12, kind of like when we were in, in Proverbs 8, one of my favorite Psalms, uh, Proverbs rather, one of my favorite chapters is chapter 8 because it's obvious that that's about Jesus. In Proverbs chapter 8, if you haven't read that, that's a good one to get familiar with. Um, it starts out talking about wisdom as a woman, but then you really get into this, I was there before there was anything. <laughs> and by me, kings reign, and the, things happen because of me. And, and we see the similarities there with Jesus and just how clear the picture becomes. Kind of the same thing takes place here in chapter 12. Now, again, Solomon is the writer. He wrote thousands of Proverbs. These, these 31 that we have are just a collection of those. Solomon gives wisdom, but Jesus came onto the scene and said there was one who was greater than Solomon. Guess who he was referring to? Himself. One in your midst. That was Jesus Christ came onto the scene and he was greater than Solomon because though Solomon wrote and gave wisdom, even People came from all around, remember, to talk to Solomon and get wisdom from him. Solomon gave wisdom. When Jesus comes onto the scene, Jesus Christ is wisdom, personified. Uh, Solomon had good things to say. Jesus said what he did and did what he said. <laughs> Solomon, you cannot say the same thing about. <laughs> he did not do all of the words that are written in the book of Proverbs especially. He didn't listen to his own advice. He was very uh, uh, human in his mistakes. So, uh, Jesus, we're going to see this great uh, kind of just uh, similarities and, and how this chapter could be especially the first part of these first three verses in Proverbs chapter 12, really think, it causes you to think of Jesus. So, 
Chapter 12, verse 1. Whoso loves instruction, loves knowledge. But he that hates reproof is brutish. Um, if you have a translation that says stupid, I'm sorry. For your children's sake. <laughs> my, my daughter, Afia, she's so smart. Our little nine-year-old, she says, you know that it says stupid in the Bible. So I'm able to say it, and I had to correct her. It doesn't. It says brutish. <laughs> well, what's that mean? It means to be brute, to be harsh, to be without mercy, we might say. They were brutish when they came, and uh, Jesus remembered, uh, remembered, I believe it's John chapter 8, Jesus, when the woman caught in adultery, came, and they brought her. Those same Pharisees said to Jesus in a brutish way, we are not born illegitimately. And the inference was that it was an insult to Jesus, saying, and, and saying, you ha were born, um, you know, because of Mary and being a virgin. They all knew about that. They all knew that his birth was miraculous, but um, many of the Pharisees were being insulting, were being brutish. That's the exact, that's the best description of what that means. It's just, and it is stupidity. It's just uh, not having any kind of thought or wisdom and so if you hate reproof or correction, you're, you're going that way. Jesus loved instruction. And I had to write down, Jesus loved instruction. Do I? Do I really love to be corrected? Or is it something that bothers me? All of us hate to be corrected. And especially when it's rightfully so. Hebrews uh, chapter 5 just in case you think I'm making this up about Jesus loving correction or loving instruction, could Jesus ever be instructed on anything? Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8. Look at Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8. Concerning Jesus, it says, Though He were a son, yet He learned obedience. You think you understand who Jesus is? Start to read Hebrews. We've only scratched the surface. You know that Jesus learned how to be obedient? There's a lot in that that we don't understand. So He loved instruction. He loved, and, and anyone that loves instruction is going to find themselves loving knowledge. That is, learning. Finding out how to do things. And then verse 2, a good man? Who's that? <laughs> Jesus Christ. He's the only good man. And a good man obtains favor of the Lord. But a man of wicked devices will he condemn. So, a good man obtains favor of the Lord. Two times in the Gospel of Matthew. It's, it's told in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. Right as Jesus comes out of the water, John the Baptist baptizing him. Jesus comes out of the water and in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17, He hears a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. I fi he finds favor and obtains favor of the Lord. And then, of course, Matthew 17, later on in Matthew 17, verse 5, the Mount of Transfiguration, the same thing happens. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye Him. Listen to Him. And in that scene, Moses, who represents the law, and Elijah, who represents all of the prophets, are there. And God the Father says, the important one to listen to is Jesus, my Son. Hear Him. Now the law points to Him. The prophets all spoke concerning Jesus Christ. So the good man... That in, Pro in Proverbs 12, verse 2, is Jesus Christ. Also, side note, side question, rabbit trail. Why did Jesus get baptized? Was it because there was sin in his life and he needed to be repenting? Why did Jesus need to get baptized? Not for repentance, 
Rather, really, for submission. Submission, yeah, to the Father's plan, to the Father's will. What does baptism speak of? Going down into the grave, coming up, and, and being raised to life. That was His purpose of being baptized, so that He was speaking to you and I, showing you and I the example of dying to ourself, and being raised in Christ, raised with Christ, back to, to new life, resurrection life. But not only that, Jesus understood He came to this earth to die, to submit even to death, to be obedient to death, not only death, but death on the cross. The most heinous, the most incredible, painful death that any, anyone could endure. So the good man. And then, of course, we're still in Hebrew poetry, so you have these contrasts <laughs> in verse 2. But a man of wicked devices will he condemn. In other words, someone who's just coming up with wicked schemes, wicked things in their head, they're already condemned. They're going to be really condemned to death. So verse 3 a man shall not be established by wickedness, but the root of the righteous shall not be moved. You will not be established by wickedness. I, I like this quote. <laughs> it is never right to do wrong to do right. And a lot of people that hear that, it's never right to do wrong to do right. What I mean by that is, like we read Rahab in the Old Testament did, right? That's the exact thing. In doing wrong, telling a lie, she did what seems to be right. Why can't I do that? Because you're not a Gentile living in that time and in a culture with complete pagan gods all around and you being the only one that would desire the Jews to live. Well, everyone else was not just, uh, was told to bring them forward, was told to kill and, and report them if you see any. She then lied. The same thing happened with Cory Ten Boom, hiding the Jews in her house during the Holocaust. Is it ever right to lie? No. The Proverbs makes it clear it is never right to do wrong to do right. If you can help it, tell the truth at all costs. Trust in the Lord. Don't trust in your own, then lean in on your own understanding. Trust in the Lord. Also, another thing I wrote down, some people just don't want to learn. They think they're done. I've learned it all. I know it all. Nothing else to learn. <laughs> but if Jesus had to learn how to be obedient, I think we all, we all have our plate pretty full, don't we? Doesn't matter how long you've been walking with the Lord, there is always more that I need to learn. So, um, oh, and along the same lines is Matthew chapter 4, Jesus in the, in the temptation. It's never right to do wrong to do right. Um, in the temptation, that's exactly what Satan was uh, trying to get Jesus to do. Turn these stones into bread. It's, it's wrong to do that, but you would prove then that you're the Son of God. You know, He was tempting Him with that very idea. and this, The enemy still does that to each and every one of us today. A virtuous, verse 4 goes on, a virtuous woman is a crown to her husband. But she that makes ashamed, here's the contrast again, is as rottenness in his bones. Now, if you're here tonight, and Jesus Christ lives in your heart, and you are a child of God, you are what the Song of Solomon especially refers to as the bride of Christ. His crown. You already are married. 
you're engaged. And, and with the Word of God in Revelation later, in Revelation 19, I believe it is, calls this the wife of the Lamb, the bride of Christ. I belong to Him. So when you see and come across the virtuous woman, don't just think, well, I'm a man. That doesn't have anything to do with me. No. Put your manliness aside. Put all that aside and say, I'm the bride of Christ. I desire to be an excellent, some of the translations have an excellent wife. Bride. What does that mean? Read Proverbs 31. Get to know what the virtuous woman is. That's what Proverbs 31 is all about. Let's you in on what it means to be a godly, faithful woman. <laughs> and more than that, a godly, faithful bride of Christ. And to think that we are the crown. Jesus said it was, well, I believe it's the writer of Hebrews again, for the joy that was set before Him, He endured the cross. That was the crown. That was you. That was me. For the crown, you, you being the virtuous woman, spotless before Him. But she that makes ashamed, again, there are those that make ashamed. <laughs> yep. And God knows what that feels like. Jesus wept over Jerusalem. Why did Jesus weep over Jerusalem? Because Jerusalem was being an adulterous and unfaithful wife of God. In fact, the Old Testament calls Israel, calls Jerusalem the wife of Jehovah, God. And Hosea, if you're not familiar with that whole picture, is Hosea being a type of God, the Father, who comes and marries and betroths and in, gets engaged to a prostitute. And it's a perfect picture of sometimes the way we can be. <laughs> but in that case, it was Israel at that time, literally, taking in pagan gods, being an adulterous, a cheating wife of God. So he knew. Jesus knew. He, he wept over Jerusalem. God, the Father, knew what it felt like to be ashamed. It was as rottenness in his bones. Well, the thoughts of the righteous are right. But the counsels of the wicked are deceit. The things you dwell on, the things that we're thinking about, the things that... Um, people all around us are talking about. It's, it's going to take a toll. It's going to take... Um, it's going to either be right or it's going to be wrong. There is no uh, harm, harmless thing. Anything, you know, it always ends up doing either good or doing evil in our lives. Um, we like to think, no, uh, if I watch that show, it's, it's neither going to be damaging or helping me grow. <laughs> there ain't no such thing as that. It is always numbing and damaging if it's something that's just promoting greed, lust, <laughs> hatred, violence, all of those things that we love to watch. That's why the box offices make billions, you know. The enemy knows the thoughts of the, the righteous ought to be right, and the counsels of the wicked are deceit. In fact, verse 6, how do you know what one's thinking? The words. The words of the wicked are to lie in wait for blood. But the mouth of the upright shall deliver them. Speak things that are right. In a world that wants to confuse, that wants to take away any kind of natural truth, any kind of thing that we even can see in nature sh showing us that God is a creator, that God is creator, the creator. The wickedness that's all around us, the words that they're speaking, it's just not right. But the mouth of the righteous, I love that. The mouth of the upright, verse 6 at the end, 
That's what's going to deliver you. Speak out. Say those things. It, the word goes on. It tells us to confess with our mouths that Jesus is Lord. It's not a quiet thing that you just, well, as long as I do it in my heart and I don't, I don't want to say it out loud, why not? Because then it causes others to see. Hey, you're upright. <laughs> that, but guess what? That very The words that you speak, the mouth of the upright, it will deliver you from wickedness, from the wicked all around. A man shall be, or sorry, verse 7, the wicked are overthrown and are not, or are no more. But the house of the righteous shall stand. Verse 8, A man shall be condemned according to his wisdom, but he that is of a perverse or a crooked heart shall be despised. Oh, commended, thank you. A man shall be commended according to his wisdom. Not condemned. Yeah, that's a big difference, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have to tell you. He that is despised and has a servant is better than he that, note this, whoever's hated but has a servant, is better than he that honors himself and lacks bread. As, this is, I had to write down Acts chapter 8, or, uh, Acts chapter 12, sorry. Acts chapter 12, verse 20 and on. And if you're not familiar with it, it's the best picture I can think of somebody honoring themselves. He who honors himself. It's Herod. This Herod Agrippa that was desiring to kill Peter in Acts chapter 12. Desiring to kill Paul later. Wanted to, and he did, his, his, I believe it was his father that beheaded James earlier in the book of Acts. But Herod Agrippa is seen coming in in Acts chapter 12, verse 20 and on, coming into the Colosseum, if you will, surrounding himself with people. And they're all saying he is a god. He is a god all about Herod Agrippa. And he's just me, me, all about honoring himself, honoring and lifting up. And it says the worms ate him. In that moment, the worms came and ate him up from the inside out. Disgusting. But there in the sight of everyone, they could see. You really want to honor yourself. He had to pay all of these popular people in that day that the day when he died he knew when he died everyone would be rejoicing his family everyone and so he hired these people to have a celebration and come to his funeral that's the kind of man that Herod was the wicked are overthrown it was said that you were safer to be a pet in Herod's house than to be one of his wives or even worse, one of his children. You were safer to be one of the house pets. <laughs> Amazing. But the wicked are overthrown and are no more because of jealousy, because of rage, because of hatred, because of pride, arrogance, and honoring yourself. And what does society around us, what do colleges teach children? Teach people the first thing you need to do is forgive yourself. Love yourself. Those are the lies of the enemy that still go on all around us. The last thing I need to do is honor myself. I'll end up being eaten by worms. The scriptures are very real. When these stories, you know, it's just a great vivid picture. Don't be one that honors himself. In fact, it says later in another Proverbs, let another man lift you up. Talk good. Not about don't go around saying, I'm I'm the best. I know so much. 
but rather just be one that really does humble himself in the sight of the Lord. He will lift you up in due time. <laughs> so, a righteous man regards the life of his beast but even the tender mercies of the wicked are cruel. I, I don't even know if the wicked have tender mercies, but if they think they're being tender or merciful, it, it, it is cruel, even in that. This one gets me. Animals. Dogs and cats and people have a tendency to be nice to them. Not me, naturally, in my flesh. But this one convicts me. This scripture says a righteous man regards the life of his beast. In fact, Jesus makes this even clearer in Matthew 10, 29, talking about how every sparrow that falls, God numbers it. God's aware of it. God has a care for that sparrow, that bird. When's the last time you really thought about some little squirrel and really cared for it? Now, that the girls are exempt. The guy, the boys in here, the men. Really taking care and nurturing some little, you know, animal, whatever it is, pet. But the righteous man is sensitive and regards the life of his beast. The, the wicked just go about their ways and what they consider to be merciful or tender is cruel, actually. They consider it to be tender and merciful to allow a woman to have an abortion. That's tender and merciful. That's not even an animal. That's cruel. I, if, if there's anything that defines abortion, take them to Proverbs chapter 12, verse 10, and point that out. Even what you're calling merciful and tender-hearted, it's cruel. In fact, it's murderous. Verse 11, He that tills his land or the ground shall be satisfied with bread, but he that follows vain persons, uh, that's someone who's void of understanding or does not have understanding. Just keep tilling the ground. Just keep digging away. Just keep plowing the soil of the Scriptures. Just keep planting the seed of the Gospel. Just keep reading. Just keep studying. Even if it seems dry. And everyone around you is doing other things and they're flourishing. Even when you stop and see the vain persons all around you that are, they, man, they, they found a shortcut. I should go that way. Look at that. They're walking on coals and their feet aren't being burnt. I can do that. Don't follow vain persons. In fact, don't follow people at all. Keep your eyes on Him until the land. Keep reading. Keep studying. Just plug away. Keep plowing away at the soil of the Scriptures. I like how that's put. Because you're going to have vain persons all around saying, oh, I know what that book's about. I've read that. Anybody that says that, by the way, they don't know the true value <laughs> They don't have the Spirit of God living in them. If you're saying, oh, I've read Genesis and I'm done. <laughs> no, if you read Genesis and the Holy Spirit, you know, any book of the Bible, and the Holy Spirit is there with you, you're going to say, I want to read that hundreds and hundreds of times over and over and over again because it's alive, it's powerful, there's always something in there that's for me. It's the way I know God is real. God exists because of this book. I can know that. I can know that I know that I know that. And so, just keep plugging away. When you have those vain persons that come around, don't follow after it. Don't go that way. It'll just lead you to nowhere land. 
Verse 12, the wicked desires the net of evil, uh, evil men. Uh, but the root of the righteous yields fruit. In fact, the wicked is snared by the transgression of his lips, but the just shall come out of trouble. So you have the wicked that desire to just be on the internet. The internet of evil men, right? The web of lies, the world wide web of lies. Now, not all, not all of it's evil, but we see a lot of what it goes on in verse 9. The wicked that are snared by the transgression of their lips. Stuff that's been stated, stuff that's been stamped down on the internet. We have ways today of people seeing and hearing what we say back then. You had to really think before you spoke. People were around listening. I don't know if it's any better now. It's not. That we can just, at our fingertips, allow everyone to see what's inside our twisted little sick minds. And we say things, we send out things maybe on Facebook, and we want to take them right back. Why did I do that? Why did I say that? <laughs> don't be snared by the transgression the sin that comes out of our mouths the dirty talking the coarse jesting just the dirty jokes that are told the just they're going to come out of trouble in fact verse 14 a man shall be satisfied satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth and the recompense of a man's hands shall be rendered unto him in other words, think about what you say. When people are all around and when somebody's being talked about, you really ought to stop. Stop listening to the gossip and really come to the defense of the person that's not able to defend himself, him or herself. To be one that puts a stop to the gossip. Because the, the, uh, the wicked, uh, the transgression of their lips is speaking, of, speaking falsely against and really damaging people with your mouth. This stuff goes on all the time. But the righteous, verse 14, a man shall be satisfied with good by the fruit of his mouth. That's what there's a shortage of. Man, what that woman was like, what that man was like, what he said, it was just so true, so right on. God really uses that person. That's the fruit of the mouth. Something that causes another to grow. Something that's nurturing to others. It's nourishment, encouragement. It's just the words that we speak to each other that ought to lift and build and be causing one to grow. Not cutting down, not the way of the world, not the way of, you know, the internet. <laughs> the evil man that always is looking for the bad, always is looking for the wrong that someone did. And magnifying that. We have a habit of doing that. We blow up and, and really magnify the problem. And we forget that there's a solution to the problem. Don't, don't be like that. Just, just be encouraging. And you'll get what, what you, you'll reap what you sow. That's the idea. The recompense of a man's hands shall be rendered back unto him. Um, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes. Verse 15 is huge. This one I had underlined long, long ago when I first read it. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that hearkens unto counsel is wise. Don't think that you have life all figured out, no matter how old you are. Don't think that you have it all figured out because there's a way that seems right 
to a man, and in the end, we're going to find out later, it says, the end leads to death. But the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he that listens to counsel, be one that takes in counsel from others. Don't just do your own thing, go your own way, continue in that. But hearken, I like, hearken unto wise counsel, hearken unto that. Verse 16, a fool's wrath, or the, when, an, when a fool gets angry, it's presently known. Everybody knows it. But a prudent man covers shame. He that speaks truth shows forth righteousness, but a false witness deceit. We all know what a kid's like, little guys are like when they get angry, they don't get their way, they don't get what they want. Everybody knows it. It's a fool that acts that way. Had a display of that last night at the Redwood Gospel Mission. A prudent man hides shame. Some just flaunt it everywhere for everyone to hear, everyone to see. Don't be a fool. Be someone who's prudent. Be who's, someone who's all about love. Love for others, love for him, ultimately, love for God, not for people. So be one that not necessarily puts a, a mask on, puts a facade on. Don't be one that just puts a front on and aren't you're not genuine. That's not what's being talked about. It's being one who's in control. It's one of the, the fruits of the Spirit. Later on in Galatians chapter 5, we, we learn that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. In that list, in Galatians 5, you find self-control. That's the idea. Not that you just walk around with this fake smile on your face, acting like nothing ever goes wrong in my life, because God is with me. No. We, we should be the most real people on the planet. We should be straight up, but have self-control. Don't be a fool that's just full of deceit. And, and be the, I love verse 17. Be one that speaks truth and shows forth righteousness. Don't be one that's bearing false witness. Just believing everything out there that people might say. It, it, it brings about deceit. It's the way of the enemy. It's the way of the devil, ultimately. That's the deceiver. That's what the devil's into. There are those that sit around and think about the way to deceive other people. That's all they're all about. I just want to find out how to deceive everyone. Now, most of the time, they themselves are deceived. The ones who are deceiving others are themselves deceived. They're doing it unknowingly. And I really believe that about a lot of quote-unquote Christian false teachers. They themselves are deceived. Deceiving many, they themselves are deceived. So, the lips... Uh, uh, sorry, verse 18. Verse 18. There is that speaks like the piercing of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is health. Again, we do damage with our the words that we say. The lip of truth shall be established forever, but a lying tongue is but for a moment. <laughs> so in other words, I've talked about this quite a bit lately. It's been on my heart. Be about things that are going to last forever. You know, don't be one that's into cursing. Don't be one that's into lying, a lying tongue. It's just a moment. It's just temporary. It's just fleeting. It's gone. No one will remember it. But be one that the lip of truth, verse 19, the lip of truth will be established forever. I want things pertaining to eternity I want words that come out of my mouth that, that make health, that bring health to others. 
For deceit is in the heart of them that imagine evil. But to the counselors of peace is joy. I love that. Are you one that's for peace or one that's for deceit and evil? And you just imagine all kinds of evil. Some of us, that's the biggest uh, challenge is to turn off the brain. And the movies don't help. The TV shows don't help. The video games don't help. But turning off the brain, verse 20 is hurt. It, it, it's, the, it says the Word of God is sharp. If you let it, if you let the Word of God do its job, it will cut at you. And that one cuts me. Verse 20 cuts me because I imagine evil. Now maybe all of you are goody tissues here tonight. None of you ever have any kind of problems with it, that. But I don't want to be one that imagines evil. I want to be one that's for peace and for joy and for righteousness and for life. There shall no evil happen to the just, but the wicked shall be filled with mischief. Can't wait for that day. <laughs> Lying lips are abomination to the Lord, but they that deal truly are His delight. We read earlier, honest scales are the Lord's delight. That's kind of the, the idea there. They that deal truly. There's no deceit. There's no ripping someone off it's just a good, honest deal. It pleases God to see that. It really does. A prudent man conceals knowledge, but the heart of fools just proclaim foolishness. There's a picture for you, right? A prudent man isn't going around telling everybody, I'm wise, really prudent, listen to me. They shouldn't do that. But a fool goes around and man, you can hear the foolishness. It's just oozing out of him <laughs> from everywhere. He doesn't ever shut up. <laughs> the hand of the diligent shall bear rule, but the slothful shall be under tribute. He's going to get back to the slothful. And, uh, but that's real straightforward. If you're diligent in your work, you get promoted. Sometimes you might even find yourself being in a position of supervisor. And then, maybe even manager. And then, keep at it, diligent enough, you'll be CEO. No, that'll never happen. Just keep going at it. But the lazy man, the slothful man, is always under tribute. That's he's always under someone. He's always somebody's always going to tell him what to do. Well, heaviness in the heart of man makes it stoop or lower. But a good word makes it glad. I love that verse. In fact, medically speaking, it doesn't just. It's not just true spiritually, how that heaviness in our hearts, that is worry, anxiety, things on our hearts that are heavy, it makes us weigh, it weighs us down. It's also true physically that heart conditions, heart problems, heart disease, it happens to people most of it is attributed to stress, anxiety. And what relieves stress? Most people just say, well, a good joint will do it. Or this substance will do it. But guess what that does? You're then <laughs> relying on that rather than on Christ. The solution, of the ultimate solution for all stress, all anxiety. It's interesting that that medically is, has been proven. 
A good word, though, makes it glad, makes our hearts glad, and it ought to. The righteous is more excellent than his neighbor, but the way of the wicked seduces them. <laughs> you see, the wicked, uh, the wicked making progress, you see the wicked um, flourishing and getting the raises and getting the nicer cars, and it seems like they're making it, but don't be deceived. The righteous are more excellent than they. It's the inward man. It's the in, internal, not the external, that we should be concerned with. Then you get back to the lazy man. The slothful man roasts not that which he took in hunting, but the substance of a diligent man is precious. So even the substance, even what's left for the diligent man, he's saving it, preserving it. It's precious to him for the diligent man. The hunter that's foolish just goes and kills and doesn't really pay any attention to the meat. He doesn't use anything that he spent his time going out there and hunting. He's too lazy to roast it. <laughs> Caught a bunch of fish and he's too lazy to gut it and clean it. <laughs> it's not fun to gut fish. I can only think of gutting a deer, gutting some, some uh, big thing. You know, it's just more work. And so a lazy man just, I, I'll get around to that. No, he never does. Don't be lazy in your dealings and, and what you do. Be diligent. Again, I love this, the way it ends here. In the way of righteousness is life, and in the pathway thereof there is no death. Hallelujah. I mean, that should make anyone if you came tonight and you were bummed out and depressed and on the verge of suicide, be of good cheer because the way that speaks to you and I, in fact, Jesus Christ is the one who said in John chapter 10, 10. John chapter 10, verse 10. I came to give you life and life more abundantly. We were saying this morning and the kids were jumping up and down. Spring up, oh well. <laughs> that life, abundantly. It's not just life. <laughs> the way the world might portray life to be the best life. No. Jesus gives abundant life. I came to give you that life that it would be more abundant. John chapter 10 verse 10. There is no death for the believer. There's no bumming us out. In fact, uh, they were ticked off. <laughs> they, they were so uh, frustrated with the Apostle Paul because they could not get to him. They couldn't make him mad. Put him in prison. He's writing letters. He's saving the prison guards. He's doing all kinds of Miracles, all kinds of things are happening. The church is growing and, and being even more influenced. That didn't work. Let's stone him. Take him out, stone him. He goes, has this incredible experience, goes into heaven, comes back down, gets right back up, goes back into the city. That's how we should be. You can't keep me down. You can't get me down. You can't get to me. Like water off a duck's back, right? It just won't stick. Anything this world might throw at me, anything the enemy might throw towards me, throw my way to try to discourage me, it's just going to make me stronger. What doesn't kill me will only make me stronger. I love this. Uh, Romans 5, Romans 5.17 for if by one's, one man's offense uh, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one. <laughs> Jesus Christ. So, by one man, Adam, 
back to Genesis, death entered the world. But Romans 5.17, what it's declaring is by one man life is restored. And it's not just life for 83 years, if you're lucky. I don't believe in luck. Shouldn't have. Yeah. If you're God's, if you're trusting in the Lord, if God's good enough to let you live that long, I should say. Not that kind of life, but eternal life. That's what we're talking about tonight. At thy right hand, there's eternal, there's joy, there's peace, forevermore, life forevermore. Believe me, Jesus said, and you will never die. And we mope and, and kind of walk around with this kind of sour look on our face. How dare we? You're going to live forever. There is nothing that this world has that He hasn't cured and come up with the cure for. Nothing that the enemy might throw our way that God will not then use to just bring about incredible healing, incredible, well, just life forevermore. It's, it's powerful. And it's awesome. We should be those that are living forevermore. Father, we thank You so much. Your Word is powerful, Lord. We see how powerful the wisdom truly is when we say, we see this perfect wisdom and we say Jesus did this perfectly. How You loved instruction. How, Lord, <laughs> You were the person that showed us what wisdom truly is. What it truly means to be one who's wise. Lord, help us to keep our eyes on You. Not to be discouraged by the things that might happen around us. The things that the enemy might use to try and get to us, Lord. Help us to keep our eyes fastened on You, Lord. Because You bring true life. <laughs> Lord, You bring true love. You bring true meaning to all of it. So we just want to press in and be the virtuous wife as the crown on Your head, Lord. Help us to be the bride of Christ spotless, blameless, clothed in Your righteousness. We thank You, Father, for this time together. Pray as we sing these last two songs, You would just continue to speak to our hearts, Lord, that we would spend that intimate time in prayer, in worship, and fellowship with You. In Jesus' name, Amen.